The Lord be with you. And also with you. God is gracious and merciful and trustworthy. Let us join our voices in giving thanks. The works of God are all around us. Those who share in God's work lack for nothing. We are called to faithfulness as God is faithful. We are people of the covenant gathered to please God. Holy and awesome is God's name. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Come then as wise and faithful people. Come as a beloved community of the redeemed. We are amazed that God remembers us. We reach out to the God who cares for us. Our opening hymn today is number 127, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Please join me if you'd like. Uh, join me in singing. There we go. be seated. Shannon, I found the mistake, so we'll deal with it later. Good morning, grace and peace to everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, and welcome to our gathering for worship. Uh, what is it? It is halfway through August. That means we're only about six months before we get cool weather. <laughs> it beats 11 months, so I mean we're we're on the downhill slide. The days are getting shorter, but they're hot. And uh, hopefully we will be, uh, and they definitely humid. So anyway, we're glad that you're with us today, whether in person uh, or on one of our streaming platforms, uh, particularly if you're on Facebook, watching us on Facebook Live right now or watching us a little later on YouTube, please take a moment and leave a comment uh, that way we can consider that you're in worship with us and count you as part of our uh, congregation uh, today. If you're watching us on Zoom, this sounds kind of ominous. We know who you are. So we've already counted you if you're on Zoom. But if you're on Facebook Live or on YouTube, please leave a comment. And otherwise, we're just glad that you're here on this Lord's Day, this Day of Resurrection. And let's continue our worship this morning as J.C. leads us in our opening prayer. Beloved, we come together to praise God, to hear the Holy Word, and to seek for ourselves and others the power, presence, and direction of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. God of steadfast love, your works delight our hearts and expand our thoughts. Your grace and mercy draw us together to praise you 
and to celebrate your wonderful deeds. Dwell among us today and reign within the lives of each one gathered here. Help us to grow in discernment and understanding. Grant wisdom and courage that we may walk in your ways and keep your commandments. Amen. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us boldly profess. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. All right. I want to take a moment to share just a couple of announcements. The first one, uh, Charlie, if you would click to the first slide and uh, then the, uh, the next one as well. On Thursday of this week, um, my sister Leanne and Wendy accompanied, uh, accompanied me to Barrow and to Wild Peach Elementary School where we were very pleased to present first uh, a whole bunch of school supplies that people had donated and brought to Beth's service last month, along with the accumulated financial offerings in her memory given to support school supplies at the two schools. Ultimately, uh, we gave, first off, we divided up the school supplies as equitably as possible, but we also made sure it was age appropriate. Wild Peach had the younger kids, so they don't want the pointy scissors, and Barrow has the older kids, and they definitely don't want the blunt scissors. So things like that we divided up, and then we were honored to give a check in the amount of $1,039.50 to each of the schools. It'll be a grant that the teachers will be able to draw against as they identify uh, children in, in need, situations in need, and so forth. And I thought uh, that should be great. I know Beth would appreciate the school supplies, but also that it, it does empower the teachers to adapt to the needs. Also, if any additional funds come in, we were asked, and I said, absolutely, we'd be glad to. We were asked to go out and buy uh, hygiene and particularly underwear and socks for children. Uh, accidents happen, uh, and, uh, but hygiene, uh, socks, and underwear. So if any additional funds come in, we will do that and take them uh, to the appropriate schools. So. I believe Beth is uh, smiling in heaven over this. I know the teachers and principals were very moved by that. And I got to do something I've never done before. I have waited patiently for decades for Publishers Clearinghouse to show up at my house with the balloons and the big check. So far, they haven't. Today is still, it is still early today, so it is possible. But I got to get, hand somebody a big check. And that was so much fun. And we thank uh, Ralph De uh, Derrickson at Blue Moon Graphics in Needville for fixing those up for us uh, at no cost. 
And any of y'all concerned about the big checks, they didn't have the stuff on it, so you couldn't take advantage of it. But nevertheless, that was a lot of fun. And so if Publishers Clearinghouse, uh, if it helps, I have experience with big checks now. So just, just saying. A uh, couple of other things before we advance to the next slide. First, we need, well, we can do that. I'm just not going to talk about it yet, Charlie. So there. Ah, but anyway, we need some people to help be lay liturgists. So if you're willing to come up and read the scriptures, read the prayers, um, it's, it's a great experience. You get to learn to say some really fun words, particularly if you end up having to do it on Pentecost. But um, contact Wendy if you're interested. Um, and while you're contacting Wendy, if you're not on our mailing list, either, you know, uh, essentially, our, our, it's an email list, but if you're not on the list, call Wendy. There's the phone number on your screen, up on these screens here, or you can email her at fumclady at brazoriainet.com. That is a mouthful, and make sure you're on that list. Before we change slides also, Adjust your, your scorecards accordingly, but we will not have our choir singing today. There was just three of us, and so we took a vote, and the vote was five to nothing that we... Uh... Anyway, um, we didn't have enough voices for our choir today, and that's why I wanted to bring up that uh, we, if, if you can come close to singing, we want you in the choir. All you have to do is see Shannon or see Merle. They'd be glad to sign you up to sing with us. We have a good time. Uh, for the foreseeable future, we're just singing out of the old Cokesbury hymnal. And we have a good time <clears throat> doing that. So if you can carry a tune in a bucket, we'll get you a bucket. If you're worried that the roof will collapse if you sing, we'll get you a hard hat. So on and so forth. We'll fix you up. Come sing with us. All right, Charlie, go to the next, uh, the next slide, if you don't mind. Just a reminder, uh, uh, we're trying to make giving simple, but at the same time, I want to say thank you to everyone who has been able, and it's a tough time, and we understand, uh, able to financially support uh, our ministries here. But I don't want to forget to say that the kingdom is not about checkbooks. The kingdom is about prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. So it's not just enough, it's important, and thank you for those who are able to make a financial donation, but our call is even more broad. So if you're not able to make a financial gift at this time, you can still give a kingdom gift of, again, your prayers, presence, gift, service, and witness. Okay, Charlie, do we have another? Yes, we do, thank goodness, I had that. The food truck will be back this week at First Baptist Church. We need volunteers. I don't know what the mask situation will be for that. I've just updated the old slide, but with that scary Delta stuff going around, use your best judgment. But we need volunteers to help starting 2.30 to 3 o'clock, and uh, the food distribution starts at 4, I believe, and there's usually a pretty good crowd, so we need people that can volunteer. Also, if you know of somebody who would benefit from this, it's very, very simple. Uh, there's, they solicit just a touch of information from everybody, and it's done in a drive through fashion. You just sort of get in line, you drive up, you open your trunk or your back door, we load this stuff in, and you're on your way you know, pretty quickly. So if you know of somebody who'd benefit from it, it'll be the distribution will start at 4 o'clock, and this is in uh, concert with Brazosport Cares uh, Food Pantry and the Houston uh, Food Bank, our, our friends at the Houston Food Bank. And the food's pretty amazing every time. And so far, I think, I don't recall a time when I was there volunteering that I didn't end up taking something home, whether it was some incredible tomatoes or you know, other produce or whatnot. You just don't know what they're going to bring, but a lot of it can't go back. So. There's often tangible benefits for the volunteers just as there are wonderful tangible uh, benefits uh, for those who come. All right, I think that's all of our announcements. If there aren't any additional announcements, let's, um, 
start to bring our hearts and our minds into an attitude of prayer as Shannon leads us in our prayer hymn. Our prayer hymn today is Be Thou My Vision, number 451. <laughs> briefly go down the list of our prayer concerns and it is a very lengthy list and we continue to add to it on a weekly basis and I'm afraid with this flare of COVID the list is going to get dramatically longer. I hope and pray that that is not the case. But first for those whom we are praying for seeking improved health and healing Walter Troppy, Gary Gatton, Jock Spiro, Martha McCreary, Kenneth Goolsby, Jeremy Barton, Linda Bohannon, Caden Cranfield, Madison Glenn, Melvin Cadu, Shirley Hart, Sandy Tennant, Paul Murray, Dan Swords, D. Sipes, Bill and Sandra Clark, Scott and Kelly Crossan, Renee Harlan, Katie Hughes, Ginger Unruh, Michael Wine McAllister, Paul Richter, Tristan Rasmussen, Brittany Stapleton, and Teresa Phillips. Those on our list for whom we are praying for comfort and peace, for Betty Johnson, and then for peace, comfort, and assurance, the family of Sheila James, the family of Tommy Batters, the family of Howard Smith, and Judy Heinant and family. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we give you thanks with our whole heart. As a congregation of your faithful people, we proclaim the greatness of your works and declare honor and power to your holy name. We have been called to walk always in your ways and to treat one another with love and respect for your glory. Instead, however, we drink deeply of the transitory ways of this world and defile ourselves. The paths in which we choose to walk lead us to live outside your will, and we do not live a life of thankfulness. But it is always your way to be gracious and merciful with those who repent. 
as we confess our sin and pray for your forgiveness, send your redemption and renew each of us in your abiding covenant. Fill us with the gift of your Holy Spirit that in all our doings with one another you may be glorified. And let our lives set an example of what it means to live in your wisdom that all may come to worship you. In all manner of things, O oh God, you have shown us that your will is for us to live. Give us joy in partaking of the flesh and, and blood of eternal life as offered to us by Christ. Give new life to those who suffer from frailties of the flesh whom we have lifted before you. Touch those who feel they have no life in them and raise them up to glorify you. Comfort the dying. Assure those who mourn and grant resurrection to those who have died. Loving God, may all your works be established forever as you respond to our cries. For we offer all we have in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say with boldness, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm going to say, if you've not had an opportunity as we move into our offertory, as Shannon gets ready, if you've not had an opportunity to come up and place your offering in the offering plate, uh, here's a perfect time to do that as Shannon prepares to lead us uh, in, our, in, in her solo today. <laughs>
Please join with me in the prayer for illumination. Open, Lord, my eyes that I may see. Open, Lord, my ears that I may hear. Open, Lord, my heart and mind that I may understand. So shall I turn to you and be healed. Amen. Our reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 51 through 58. And we're reading from the Message Translation. I am the bread, living bread, who came down out of heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live, and forever. The bread that I present to the world so that it can eat and live is myself, this flesh and blood self. At this, the Jews started fighting among themselves. How can this man serve up his flesh for a meal? But Jesus didn't give an inch. Only insofar as you eat and drink flesh and blood, the flesh and blood of the Son of Man, do you have life within you. The one who brings a hearty appetite to this eating and drinking has eternal life and will be fit and ready for the final day. My flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. By eating my flesh and drinking my blood, you enter into me and I into you. In the same way that the full, fully alive Father sent me here, and I live because of him. So the one who makes a meal of me lives because of me. This is the bread from heaven. Your ancestors ate bread and later died. Whoever eats this bread will live always. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As I sat down the other day to prepare the script, if you will, my manuscript, there actually is one, for today's sermon, and as I was putting together the message, and I read back over our text from John today, and one verse grabbed my attention. It's verse 52. <clears throat> Jesus is trying to teach the crowd who he is. Reinforced by the illustration of that recent feeding miracle where he fed the multitude. Uh, and this action throughout the gospel happens at least six more times with six more signs. Jesus does miraculous, extraordinary things <clears throat> the outcome of which, hopefully, is people will come to realize who he is. As I said before, the evangelist John, who wrote this down, said the purpose of writing it down was so you would come to know who Jesus was. That matters, because in that is salvation. So, our Lord is telling the people who he is, and, well, letting his actions speak as well, but the people aren't getting it. Maybe they're just hungry. I mean, it is morning after all, and breakfast is the most important meal of the day, at least until lunch. We are told kids at least learn better in school if they've had a nutritious breakfast first, right? But regardless of this breakfast angle, it's obvious to me, and probably to you as well, that the crowd isn't comprehending what Jesus is trying to teach. I imagine myself in a calculus class. Huh? What? Huh? I, no, I am not. I actually have a friend who at dinner one night was explaining, an electrical engineer, he was explaining and he said, oh, it's nothing but a simple differential equation. Okay. 
Anyway, so they're not getting it. Jesus is demonstrating. Jesus is embodying. Jesus is teaching. He's doing what rabbis do. But they're not getting it. And in verse 52, Jesus said, I am the bread, the living bread, who came down out of heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live and forever. That's good news, isn't it? Hallelujah. I mean, eternal life is an amazing gift. Right? Yeah? Okay. But apparently the crowd isn't hearing what Jesus is saying or at least not understand what he's meaning. They said, it says at this, after Jesus said this, the Jews started fighting among themselves, asking how can this man serve up his flesh for a meal? And that little verse right there caught my attention. And frankly, it's a good question. But think about this situation one more time. It's, it's an absurd scenario. Jesus proclaims the good news of salvation to eternal life. Amen? He offers his audience not just bread, not just danishes and croissants and muffins for breakfast. He offers his flesh and blood. And we know he was ultimately talking about the cross and his death and resurrection. But he offers them the bread of life, life forever. And they respond by fighting with each other and wondering, wait, 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 wait. Just hold on a minute. Back up. Beep, beep, beep. Who is this man and what's with that bread? Jesus offers life to the world. And people don't respond in faith or charity or hope. They, result, they respond in fisticuffs. That's a terribly poor but an incredibly normal human response to the voice of the good shepherd. And, but, but, but beyond the quarrel, which just does seem absurd, maybe, it's their, maybe they're just hungry, I don't know. The question remains, even with us millennia after this little pericope, how can this man, and frankly it's a question we too need to come to grips with, Let's pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart here be acceptable unto you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Friends, a few years ago when I was in college, few, few, yeah. Back when I was in college, I was, I'll tell you how long ago it was, this class actually used a 16 millimeter projector to do this. But I was lucky enough to take a fun elective in college. Actually, I took two of them. They were film courses. I needed elective hours. And I've forgotten what, I got, what department I got credit for this in, but it counted. One of them was Images of Christ in Film. And that was a neat course. We'll get into that later. The other one was Westerns. And I like a good Western. There you go. In fact, I was watching one the other night on the DVR. I watched Silverado again, which I really enjoy. So I like Westerns. And it was Westerns that came to mind as I was hearing the, that verse and the crowd and thinking about this sermon. One of my childhood favorite TV shows was The Lone Ranger. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if every episode ended this with these same words, but it seems to be most of them did anyway. People would ask, after these extraordinary things happened, they would ask, who, yeah, who is or who was that masked man? Well, you know, they could have gone over and said, hey, would you take your mask off or, you know, whatever. But anyway, who was that masked man? Somebody had come into town. Lone Ranger and Tonto and defeated the bad guys and restored the, the fortunes of a person, a town, or whatnot, and bewildered and astonished, if thankful, the town folk and bystanders would wonder aloud about their true identities. 
Who were these two men that did such extraordinary deeds? We never found out, but it had the best theme song, Rossini's Overture to the William, uh, uh, Rossini's William Tell Overture, incredible. So also you hear a question like that asked at the Pentecost after uh, the Holy Spirit descends on the disciples, they become apostles and start sharing the gospel in all sorts of languages. And it said, astonished and amazed, the people asked, who are these men? Whoa. You know, they were just ordinary fishermen. Now they are evangelists in all sorts of interesting language like the Phrygians and the Pamphylians and read the Pentecost. Be a lay reader on Pentecost. You'll get good at that. Well, the hungry pre-breakfast crowd there in Capernaum in the sixth chapter of John is essentially asking the same thing and fighting about the answer. I can't get over that. It's kind of like, do you know Jesus? Nope, I'm going to punch you in the nose. Do you know Jesus? I'm going to punch you in the nose again. Do you know Jesus? We wouldn't do that. But think about that. You're offered eternal life. Okay. Boom. My DS can beat up your DS or whatever. It's just, but how can this man, Jesus, or any human for that matter, serve up his or her flesh for a meal? That's, that's actually pretty icky if you think about it superficially. But more importantly, how can this man feed a multiple thousand person crowd with only a couple of fish sandwiches? What about the butler who brought the water to him at the wedding in Cana and he turns it into wine? Whoa, what is this? When he walks on the water, even his disciples don't get the message. Well, friends, the answer is quite simple and at once very, very complicated. First, he is the son of God. That's why, amen? amen. He's the Messiah, holy God and holy man, the living embodiment of humankind and the God self. He is our Lord and savior, our master and teacher, our God and our friend. That's how he did it. And ironically, this crowd who was in the presence of the Prince of Peace is quarreling and fighting about his identity. They just didn't understand. Thankfully, though, we do, right? I mean, we've all read the word and understand the true identity of Jesus of Nazareth. We know and can cite and remember and follow his teachings, right? gotten quiet in here. Thank goodness we have some kids, some background noise. Y'all are getting kind of quiet on me. How about we always follow his one commandment to love one another as he loves us, Amen. right? We follow those. Well, okay, I don't either fully, so I'm trying. <sighs> well, if we don't, we're in good company. We have a good excuse, right? His very own disciples didn't understand who he was. In fact, in the eighth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus and the twelve are at Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asks them a very similar question. He says, who do the people say I am? And he's a good teacher. He asks the question first and then kind of points and looks and because you don't want to go, okay, Judy, who, because then everybody else doesn't listen. He, ans he asks this question rhetorically. And they say to him, some say you're John the baptizer. Others say Elijah. Some others say one of the prophets. And then he asks them, and you, what are you saying about me? Who am I? And Peter gave the answer, right? You are the Christ the Messiah, the son of the living God. He gave the right answer, 100%. Now, as you know, I was married for almost 35 years to a math teacher. And math teachers have a peculiar way of looking at things mathematically. Thank goodness she could do 
fractions and things that I can't. But they always wanted you to show your work. You know what I'm talking about? If they ask you, what's the meaning of life, the universe, and everything, they don't want you just to write down 42. You better be able to show the equations because they want to know that you really know how you got that answer, and I never knew how I got that answer. So it was, it was pretty awful. Well, Jesus decides to do like Beth would do to her students. He asks, he follows it up kind of saying, well, are you showing your work? Are you showing, you gave the right answer, are you showing your work? And within a couple of verses, Peter very clearly demonstrated he didn't understand who Jesus was, what the meaning of his ministry, and particularly the coming meaning of the cross. He didn't understand. And he would be probably the strongest rebuke Jesus gives in the Bible is to Simon Peter there at Caesarea Philippi, get behind me, Satan. You have no idea how God works. He didn't understand who Jesus was. And not too long afterwards, his misunderstanding would result in denial when challenged by bystanders after Jesus' arrest, right? And even toward the close of the Gospel of St. John, he still expresses uncertainty and, and caution, circumspection as to who Jesus is and what Jesus is calling him to do when he says, when he calls him and tells him, to feed, do you love me and then to feed my lambs? That's fodder for a different sermon. But even toward the end of the Gospel of John, after all of this, Simon Peter still didn't clearly understand who Jesus was. It was like my understanding of algebra after two times going through it in college. At the end of it, as long as I got a passing grade, I didn't care. And I still don't understand. I just tell why I'm not looking for your ex. You know, it's just, anyway. It's hard to follow, friends, when we don't understand hard to follow. I keep wanting to go ride that roller coaster. Is it Space Mountain at, at Disney World that's inside and part of it is dark? And I'm like, ooh, but you can't see the dips. You don't know what's coming next. Ooh, how scary. Oh, yeah. I love roller coasters. But anyway, speaking of that, let's, if it's hard to do things we don't understand, let's take a vacation. Who's all in for a vacation here? You just had one, Shannon. You, you, you have to stay. You know, most of us would readily hop on an airliner and allow ourselves to be sealed in an airtight aluminum tube with more than 100 of our closest and dearest strangers and then be propelled by jet engines through the stratosphere or the troposphere, something like that up there, at roughly 600 miles an hour over thousands of miles, right? And statistics tell us that the plane ride is actually the safest part of our vacation. It's safer than Space Mountain. It's safer than the drive to the airport. But how many of us understand actually how an airplane flies or how a jet engine works? Hmm. Have you ever heard of the 18th century Swiss mathematician Daniel Bernoulli? All, no, okay. Actually, it was Bernoulli's equations that led to the wonder of flight and the reliability and safety of that airtight aluminum tube winging us through the sky to our vacation. And maybe if I could do the math of the Bernoulli equations, which I can't, I would be an even more patient and cooperative passenger. Understanding things can help us accept them. Understanding can help us. Imagine a child, and we have a couple of them here that are given great energy today, so the rest of you can squirm if you would like. Just this week, y'all can squirm a little bit. Giggling is allowed, right? Yes. That's it. So we're good. 
Imagine a child in the hospital, surrounded by bright lights and scary machines, with blinky lights and buzzy, buzzy alerts, and lots of pointy, sticky, ouchy things, and understanding little, if any. It's terrifying. I can't even imagine. But I've been there. We were all children, most of us anyway, were children at one time. And we've been there. We don't understand that the pointy, sticky, ouchy thing is going to make us feel better. We just don't want him to put the pointy, sticky, ouchy thing in us because it, ow, it hurts. Hmm. And yes, friends, the crowd in Capernaum that day didn't understand. And, and maybe that uncertainty and the fear of the unknown led in part to the quarreling. But Jesus was undaunted and he continued to explain. He says, only insofar as you eat and drink flesh and blood, the flesh and blood of the Son of Man, do you have life within you? The one who brings a hearty appetite to this eating and drinking has eternal life and will be fit and ready for the final day. My flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. By eating my flesh and drinking my blood, you enter into me and I into you. In the same way that the fully alive Father sent me here and I live because of him, so the one who makes a meal of me lives because of me. This is the bread of heaven. Your ancestors ate bread and later died. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. He's speaking in part about Moses and the Israelites and the Sinai when they were hungry and the back to Egypt committee was conspiring to say, let's go back and be slaves in Egypt. And they prayed and they got manna from heaven, right? And water from a stone. I've said someday I am going to publish my book on relationships entitled Women from Venus, Manna from Heaven. But at this point, I haven't done that. Um, when Moses and the Israelites ate manna and drank water from the rock, they still died. Moses died looking at the, at the promised land, but he died. The Israelites died. The prophets died. The patriarchs, later on, they would all die. But if you follow Jesus and eat of the bread, you will live. Friends, Jesus is offering bread from heaven. The uh, uh, unwarranted, unmerited, undeserved, unexpected, undeniable gift of salvation from sin to eternal life. A new day, a new way, hope and life. But. To receive this bread, the, the crowd has to stop their bickering. They have to stop their fighting. They have to sit down. They have to take and eat and receive. When he fed them dinner across the Sea of Galilee the night before, they sat peacefully on an idyllic hillside together and in peace. That's how you eat the bread of life, together as one in peace and in gratitude. So by way of conclusion, let me ask you, that's the so, here's the so what. How are we doing with that meal? How are we doing? Are we really gathered as one? Are we really gathered as one, or are we just a, an, a, a conglomeration of lots of individuals? As Methodists, let me tell you, the number one was really important to John Wesley. One defined the church, the big C church, not the little C church, the big C church, the body of Christ that we have talked about over the last couple of weeks. John Wesley asked rhetorically, what is the nature of the church? What is the church? And then he answered it in a sermon entitled, get this, On the Church. That's the title of it. He said, here then is a clear and unexceptionable, I like how he talks, answer to that question. What is the church? 
the Catholic or universal church, that's little c Catholic, is all the persons in the universe whom God hath called out of the world as to entitle them to the preceding character, to be of one body, united by one spirit, having one faith, one hope, one baptism, one God and Father of all. You catching the ones in there? All right. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in them all. Number one. So are we really gathered as one? Are we peaceful and peaceable with one another? Are we showing charity? Are we showing neighborly? Are we showing agape love for one another? Are we competing? My DS can beat up your DS. You know, that sort of thing. Are we expecting? Are we waiting on? Are we hungry for the bread of life? And would we sit down in peace and receive it? And who do we say this man is? Our answers, friends, matters because our understanding of our call, our walk of discipleship is contingent upon understanding both the identity of the caller and the nature of our call. And don't just say, well, I'm a lay person. I don't have a call. Doesn't work that way. Some of us are called to do this, but everyone is called and equipped by God through the Holy Spirit to do kingdom work, to be a vital and viable part of the body of Christ. So what are you called to do? And who's calling you to do it? We all have our vocation. That's what call, vocation means. But to fulfill them, we have to know the one. The one who fulfills the law, the word, love, the promise of salvation, and fulfills, fills us full of the bread of life through the gift of the cross and the empty tomb. Friends, we need to know this man. We need to know who this man is. And we must be ready and able to answer and show our work the question of who he is if we are ever going to understand how he can do all that he does. But the simple answer is simple. How can this man feed us with his flesh and blood? How can this man die upon the cross the most hideous, pitiful, worst way? Friends, if you're crucified dead, there is no deader than crucified. How can this man roll the stone away? How can this man leave a guarded, imperially guarded tomb? How can he fold the shrouds and the grave clothes? How can he appear to the women? How can he appear in the Galilee to the disciples? How can he do this? Because, friends, he is our Lord. Amen? Because he is our master. Amen? And because he is our God. And friends, because he lived and died and rose again to, to give us life. Because he is the bread of life. So what's your answer to the question? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If there's anyone here today who would like to unite with our church by any means by which we're able to accept members, uh, you'll, you're invited to come once our musicians make their way up to the front as we stand and sing together. Our final hymn is out of the faith we sing, Grace Alone. Grace Alone. There you go. And as it is comfortable to do, I invite you to stand.
one of my favorite songs in Faith We Sing. This is so cool. said it was a good one, wasn't it? That's a pretty... <clears throat> I want to thank you for worshiping with us today, and I hope you'll join with me in sharing the good news and offering the bread of life to those that we encounter this day and every day. Hear this benediction. May the peace which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now rise and go into peace. And may the blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you this day and abide with you evermore. Amen.